Welcome to this podcast from Neurogastroenterology and Motility. It publishes original research and topical reviews on basic and clinical aspects of gastrointestinal sensation and motility, as well as brain-gut interactions. So welcome everyone to this month's podcast from Neurogastroenterology and Motility. Uh, I'm Adam Farmer, I'm a gastroenterologist at the Wingate Institute uh, in London. This month it's my real pleasure to welcome uh, both Drs John Van Horn and Andre Iremia, who are both assistant professors at the University of Southern California and have extensive experience in brain imaging and neuroscience across a number of disciplines uh, which relate to, to our field. So I'd like to, to welcome you both to the podcast this month and congratulations to you and your co-authors on your paper entitled Altered Viscerotopic Cortical Innovation in Patients with uh, Irritable Bowel Syndrome. So Andre, perhaps I could uh, start with you if I may. Uh, could you give me a little bit of background to the use of uh, functional imaging techniques in the study uh, um, of Irritable Bowel Syndrome? Uh, sure. So, um, functional and structural alterations of the uh, bidirectional interactions between the gastrointestinal tract and the human brain have been reported in a number of studies. And uh, what some of these studies have found is that uh, there are both gray matter and white matter alterations in the brains of patients with irritable bowel syndrome compared to the normal population. And um, what studies have also found is that uh, brain activation patterns in response to visceral stimulation uh, yield uh, to uh, sensory motor network activation um, in the brains of in response to visceral pain and and this has been found by a number of studies which use functional uh, metabolic and electrophysiological measurements. And certainly, are, are the differences that one sees uh, in healthy controls different from, from IBS patients? Yes. Uh, what, uh, what has been found is that um, there are both white matter integrity uh, differences as well as gray matter differences between healthy control patients and patients with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And that has been confirmed by a number of studies. Okay, that's really, really great. So, John, really for the non-specialist listener, could you give me some technical background on the use of uh, 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 diffusion sensor imaging in in delineating connectivity? Certainly, Adam. So the uh, diffusion tensor imaging is a very interesting methodology <clears throat> excuse me that uh, is used uh, using the MRI scanner uh, so the magnetic resonance imaging uh, device to be configured to look at the diffusion of uh, water molecules uh, in the living brain and in living tissue and uh, that um, you can uh, uh, configure the scanner to be able to do this and extract uh, uh, white matter fiber pathways uh, after a little bit of mathematical juggling. Uh, and that's uh, uh, some of the techniques that are being used uh, increasingly across a number of different disorders uh, of the brain um, to look at it not, not only in disorders but also in healthy brain. And as we're beginning to see increasingly in uh, patients with irritable bowel syndrome and other motility disorders. So, Andre, if I could come back to you, what do we already know about uh, diffusion tensor imaging in, in other mm-hmm. disorders of uh, chronic pain? Uh, so, basically, uh Previous studies uh, that have used DTI to study the um, inter- um, IBS uh, syndrome have found that uh, there are differences in uh, white matter myelination, possibly, between um, the two populations, and there are significant differences in the properties of certain white matter connections uh, as a function of sex. Uh, and this has been done also um, in studies by some of our collaborators. Uh, so there is, it's very interesting because um, a lot of these studies have looked at the properties of white matter connections, but they have not looked at uh, how various portions of the cortex are innervated uh, differently in the two populations. So what was your hypothesis as you uh, embarked on your study? So our hypothesis uh, was that IBS patients and healthy controls exhibit uh, 
statistically significant differences with regard to the white matter connections which innervate each cortical location. And therefore, what methods did you um, employ to uh, test your hypothesis? We acquired um, both uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging volumes as well as diffusion tensor imaging volumes from a total of 89 patients. Uh, who included uh, 23 patients with IBS, and we computed uh, the cortical interconnectivity and cortical thickness in each of these patients, as well as the white matter connectivity between uh, every pair of gyri and sulfa in the brain. And what we did then was to compute the connectivity density between regions, as well as the mean fractional and isotropy of which of each white matter fiber bundle, which is uh, the, a measure to describe the extent of white matter diffusion in the brain. And after that, we applied a statistical analysis using multivariate regression to determine whether uh, any of the independent feature variables in our study, namely age, sex, cortical thickness, mean fractional and isotropy of connections innervating the cortex could predict uh, IBS diagnosis. So, John, could you just uh, um, tell us what the key results of your study were? Certainly. So, uh, these are preliminary findings for this particular cohort. They're somewhat of an extension uh, of some previous findings that were found by um, uh, our colleague uh, Emeryn Mayer and his team, who are based at UCLA. Um, and they are that uh, visceral pain syndrome and brain structure uh, tend to be related to um, uh, issues of, of connectivity, as Andre described, um, and associated with uh, neuropathology of uh, potential neurological relevance uh, in this patient. Um, so where we looked at or these patients, where we looked at connectivity uh, density issues, there were certain brain regions uh, that were uh, more or less connected uh, in the patients than were in the uh uh, normal healthy control cohort. And to that, I might add um, that we found uh, one the most uh, one interesting finding um, of this study is that um, healthy controls and IBS subjects differ significantly within both the left and right viscerotopic portions of the primary sense of somatosensory cortex, uh, which is very interesting because. Um, these findings indicate possibly uh, that there are um, differences in connectivity uh, and in how the somatosensory cortex and especially the uh, viscerotopic portion of the primary somatosensory cortex uh, differs um, between the two populations. And although I appreciate this wasn't a longitudinal study, Andre, do, do you think this is a cause or an effect? Um, although I appreciate it would just be a postulation at this stage. Yes, so um, in that respect, uh, it is not yet unclear. Um, it could be uh, that um, this difference in innervation of the somatosensory cortex between the two populations is perhaps a risk factor uh, for IBS. It's possible that um, these changes are induced uh, by the fact that uh, the patient, these, the patients who have IBS suffer from this condition, or it could be that differences in the brain lead to uh, differences uh, and to manifestations of IBS um, in in the IBS cohort that we examined. So what were the limitations of your study then, Then, in your opinion? Well, uh, we would like, uh, what would be um, interesting is to, to do a study that would include um, a more um, diverse sample, given, that, um, given the heterogeneity of the IBS population. Um, and then uh, it would also be interesting to evaluate uh, how... Uh, these cortical innervations, uh, how they differ between the two uh, sets of patients uh, depending on sex and on age, as well as other um, um, traits such as anxiety which have, or 
other um, mental health patterns that um, exist in IBS patients with preponderance compared to healthy controls. So, John, certainly from a clinician's uh, perspective, my experience is that uh, irritable bowel syndrome represents a, a very heterogeneous group uh, of both patients and indeed subtypes within that. How do we interpret the, the results from your study in that sort of context? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, it, it is a very heterogeneous group. There are different subtypes, and whether or not one has one particular syndrome of, of IBS or, or another is one of the, uh, as Andre kind of mentioned, one of the limitations of our particular study. We can't really be specific to uh, a, a more a general subtype. That would be certainly one of the goals of extending this kind of research. Um, and I think that what one would want to do eventually is to have a heterogeneous enough group that subgroups might emerge from them and results like this could be used as biomarkers uh, so that if one saw a particular pattern of connectivity change uh, in a particular patient, one could associate it with different subtypes and help to make uh, diagnosis uh, more precise. Uh, and then it could be uh, utilized to target treatment specifically for that particular patient in that particular subgroup. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think it, it um, reflects the sort of holy grail within the area of trying to uh, individualize uh, therapy for our patients. What do you think are the, are the main no uh, knowledge gaps now that, that remain in the field, and how do you see this area uh, developing in, in the future? Well, certainly, the uh, as you kind of mentioned, you know, the personalized medicine aspect of this is emerging in recent years uh, across a broad range of biomedical research uh, domains. Neuroimaging is no different. I would love to see us moving towards a, a time when we've filled in some of those knowledge gaps where we can be more precise about the patterns of connectivity change that we're observing in these studies and being able to map that specifically onto disorders you know, like like subgroups within the general term of IBS, whether or not it's you know, some broad sense IBS or whether it's more specific to Crohn's disease, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know any other subtype, it would be a wonderful place to to get to uh, in a few years. I agree, and I think it would uh, represent a great advance um, uh, for our patients in improving their their outcomes. So with that, I'd like to, to thank you both sincerely for, for your time and, and your co-authors for, for a really excellent paper and assisting in this month's podcast. I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in and I look forward to welcoming you next month on another instalment. Further information about this paper can be found on the journal website. We hope that you have enjoyed this podcast and we look forward to welcoming you to next month's edition.